that's the interesting thing about teaching too is, is a great teacher can transmit knowledge that the student isn't even aware that they're receiving Welcome to another episode of Contrabase Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, bringing you this week jazz, the world of jazz. We're covering jazz with five episodes this week. This is four of five. So we're talking with artists involved in different areas of jazz, different stages of their career, different parts of the country. I'm having so much fun putting these together, and I'm really excited to bring you today's episode featuring David Arend, who actually was active here in the Bay Area for a long time, though he lives in New York City now. And he has fused his classical jazz and composition skills together in fascinating ways. I got connected with David through his publicist, Bob Lord, sent me some links to some of his compositions. So I clicked them and all of a sudden was captivated. I found, what, what is this music? Fascinating to me. So got in touch with David. We chatted and we had a great and wide ranging conversation on topics like what David has done to stand out from the crowd. That's where we start today. How studying at Oberlin propelled him in unexpected ways into what he's doing today. How he composes his compositional process and how he structured it to get that creative energy flowing. I love talking about topics like this. This is a really fun conversation. You'll also be hearing a couple excerpts, one from his bass concerto, Voyager, and then we'll close out with Swimming Upstream, which is a collective improvisation. I really encourage you to check out his website, davidaron.com, for more musical examples and what he's up to. I'd also like to thank D'Addario Strings for sponsoring Contrabass Conversations. Thank you so much for making this show possible. And for your latest giveaway for Kaplan Strings, D'Addario is giving away 10 sets of Kaplan Strings to podcast listeners. And I've been really enjoying these strings. They're on my bass right now. I've got the C extension. I've got the medium tension. They play great. They sound great for pizzicato and for arco. They've got a rich tonal color palette, beautifully balanced, played by so many great artists like past podcast guests, Kurt Maroki, Mike Valerio, David Allen Moore. The list goes on and on. They're available in light, medium, heavy tension, Solo tuning, designed, engineered, and crafted in New York, in their New York facilities. I'd also like to thank the Bass Violin Shop, which offers the Southeast's largest inventory of laminate, hybrid, and carved double basses. And they do professional setups, repairs, and restorations at reasonable prices. They go beyond their customers' expectations with meticulously set up basses. That's so important, getting your bass set up right. They're friendly and helpful. They have highly skilled luthiers with one common goal in mind, which is making their customers happy with whatever bass they happen to play. So whatever your playing needs, the bass violin shop will work hard to get the most out of your instrument without blowing your budget. Check them out at BassViolinShop.com. And thank you also to Rosin Saver, which is a revolutionary storage device. I love this thing. It keeps bass rosin feeling as fresh as the day it was made. It's used by members of the New York Philharmonic, Toronto Symphony, LA Phil, Cleveland Orchestra, Seattle Symphony, and many other great ensembles. And if you go to rosinsaver.com and use the promo code HEATH, H-E-A-T-H, you get 10% off your order. Promo code HEATH at rosinsaver.com. All right, here we go with our conversation with David Arend. It might be kind of interesting just to dig into that concept of of standing out from the crowd because you you know talking about New York and the hundreds of bases or maybe thousands of bases that are there this sort of like the ma- the qualified masses right like what what can people do t- or what have you done that that makes you stand out from the crowd? Sure, I mean uh, the short answer is is you. Um you probably don't plan these things. Uh, you know, you sort of, uh, you go through your life, um, discovering your interests, nurturing, uh, your strengths, um, following leads, following hunches, um, trusting your instinct. And, um, and so you eventually have this, this, uh, set of decisions 
and you look back and you say, oh my gosh, this has been my, my path. This has been my life story so far. And you can look back on that path and see these important stops along the way or people that you met who, who radically altered your path and, and inspired you. I, you know, one thing I've been looking at recently is looking at other artists and not just musicians, but let's say painters, for example. So um, I was over in Barcelona, Spain, and I got to check out the, uh, the Joan Miro uh, Foundation. There's a museum there with like, the most, you know, the biggest collection of, of Joan Miro artwork in the world. And I was really blown away, uh, of course, just by the art, but also seeing how he evolved. Um, you know, and so you look at the early works and you see, you know, who he's inspired by or who he's maybe, maybe copying or influenced by. And then you watch his progression and you see these breakthroughs. You see these moments of, of an original voice breaking, breaking through. And that, that fascinates me because it, this is pertinent to your question of, you know, so where am I now and where am I going and how did I get to where I am now? And, and what, what is that identity that I have? It's a, it's a curious question for any artist as to how they find their voice. And I think that's really what it's all about is, is being uh, honest to yourself and trying to discover your, your own voice, your unique voice. Because every human being is, is completely unique. And I often think of, um, of people as, as, I love this metaphor of, of the prism, you know, where you can you, uh, send white light into a prism and then a, a, a rainbow you know, is, uh, is cast out on the other side, right? So it's like you are this mechanism and, you know, whatever you want to call it, life, you know, filters through you and, and you are this prism and then, it, but you're a unique prism. And so the way that life filters through you, whatever image that's going to cast, whatever you, whatever the output is on the other end of that, which could be just you as a person or your friendships or family or career or artwork, whatever it is, um, that's completely unique. And so how do you hone, I guess, or develop your prism? How do you develop yourself um, so that you can flow whatever it is, light or energy or life through you? Um, and so this is, this is uh, what your question makes me think about. And so when I look at other artists, I'm fascinated. So also in, in Barcelona, there's um, a wonderful Picasso museum. And they have a lot of early Picasso. Picasso is, is, is amazing, of course, because he, he moved through so many phases and he, he adapted and shifted and changed. You know, it reminds me of Miles Davis, who moved through so many phases, you know, really experimenting um, and, and always kind of reinventing oneself so that maybe there's never an arrival. You know, I don't know that there's, you know, there's you're just continually... Um, and I, I like to think of the Buddhist, you know, metaphor of peeling away the layers of the onion, you know, there's, always, there's another layer and another layer and another layer. And, and is there really anything, any, I mean, there is something at the core or maybe I guess for the Buddhist emptiness is at the core, but, but you know, that you're moving closer and closer to a rarefied or pure version of yourself or, or that prism, that artistic prism. Yeah. I think about like say Salvador Dali. Um, you know, it's well known that he spent some time, it may have been just a summer, but he spent some quite, you know, some hours copying, copying masterworks, you know, and, and studying brushstrokes and, and mastering those brushstrokes all to serve the purpose of him finding his own style, which, you know, now we look at a Dali and we're like, Hey, that's Dali. You know, um, I would love to be a, a bass player or a musician someday where, you know, uh, a person could listen to five seconds of my bass playing or just a small s snippet of a composition and say, hey, that's David. You know, that's mm -hmm. I hear his personality. I hear his his style or whatever that is. You know, that that would mean that I've that I've been able to reach a place where, OK, here's my voice and it's a recognizable voice, mm -hmm. certainly in order to get to where I am now. And I don't feel like I'm I don't feel like I'm anywhere yet. You know, I mean, it's. Yeah. If, if life is this huge, you know, ascent uh, up a mountain, you know, I've got a long, 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 long way to go. Um, I think that can be an apt metaphor also, life as, as this sort of ascension up a mountain and that as you gain experience and you work hard and you meet people and you develop, you kind of get a, a broader and broader view of what's going on around you. 
um, but there's always there's always more. You know, there's always um, further along that you could uh, that you could go to develop yourself and to expand your vision um, of yourself, of art, of life, of humanity, of like what are we doing on this rock? You know, in the middle of space. Yeah, I mean. There are all kinds of levels that you can set your zoom, you know, and sort of, you know, wonder and 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 uh, and and consider and think about um, where you fit into all of that. Anyway, and so that first that first teacher, she um, she taught me how to you know how to hold the bow and how to stand at the base. But what she really taught me, what she really transmitted was love, like love of the instrument, awe. You know, I remember she would say things, she would say, just out of the blue, she would just be like, yeah, Charlie Hayden, man. And and I had no idea who that was or what she was talking about, but there was some mystical way that she said Charlie Hayden's name. You know, Charlie Hayden, man. And I'm just like, well, who is, what, who, what's, what? <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> um and then, but then eventually, I checked out Charlie Hayden and, and his playing, um, and, and I was like, ah, that oh, okay, that's why she had this sort of mystical tone and this like sort of glow about her when she would say his name because he was such a, a mystical player and uh, you know so spiritual and um, and so she was she was able to transmit you know some of this stuff. That's the interesting thing about teaching too is is a great teacher can transmit knowledge that the student isn't even aware that they're receiving yeah right you know right. and it's all absolutely it's, right and it's like planting seeds and maybe in some ways where it's it's this little seed and it's been planted and who knows when that thing's going to sprout you know when that and i mean i and i think of my own teachers sometimes i understood what they were saying right away sometimes i got it the next day or a week later but I remember there were some things that, that my bass teachers taught me that it, w it was years after they told me something that it clicked. And I was like, whoa, you know, I'm getting chills now just thinking about it. But it's that, and, you know, and these are those moments of discovery throughout your life that are just like, wow, OK, this there is something magical going on here, you know. Planting those seeds, that's an amazing, and that's like, I, I continue to have my mind blown from lessons I learned like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago from teachers, right? I, I even recently, one of my jazz a jazz pianist I studied with at Northwestern. Uh, I, like I just recently had a realization, that's what he was talking about. Those are such amazing moments. Yeah. Yeah, that's really inspiring. Also, for when we do teach ourselves, and I've done some teaching, a good amount of teaching, and I really, I really love it. But, you know, can I do that for someone else? You know, how can we enable other people's learning? And because and, for them, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's an aha moment. It's a, it's a, it's this moment of revelation or realization. You know, that's a very mystical process as to how that happens and when that happens and when a person's ready um, you know, so, so yeah, so my first bass teacher was amazing in terms of planting this love and this passion and this sort of awe of, of the instrument and of, and of other bass players and respect of, uh, towards other players. Um, you know, the bass world tends to be not nearly as competitive in a negative way as, I don't know, typically people's, you know, people might describe, say, the classical violin world as being very competitive or, or piano, you know, classical piano, um, you know, that's for sure that, that, I mean, you have more violinists in the world than bassists and more pianists. And so just by virtue of the fact that there are more people doing it, um, you do have more competition, um, for people trying to get into Northwestern or whatever school it is. And so, uh, and so bass players tend to be a little more chilled out. We tend to be, uh, we tend to view each other really as sort of like a collective and like a family, um, that we're all sort of cousins or brothers and sisters. And, um, so that's cool. So that's, a, that's nice that, that I stumbled into an instrument that, um, that has a good vibe amongst its practitioners, you know, you know, then I've just, I've always been playing jazz and I've always been playing classical. That's just ever since I guess I was maybe 19 or 20. Um, and so, you know, for several years at Oberlin, I was, you know, striving to be the top classical player, um, but also very much wanting to be, um, you know, everybody's dream jazz bass player. And, and by that, I mean, I wanted to be the, the bass player that you wanted to work with, 
you know, I wanted to be the bass player that a jazz composer wanted to have doing their tune or that a sax player wanted backing them, you know, uh, in their band. How could I play that role? You know, what does it mean to be uh, a good jazz bass player? And, and how can I, how can I learn how to be that in service to the band or in service to the music? It reminds me of a comment that a, a violist in a string quartet uh, once said, I, I overheard this string quartet rehearsing and they were curious as to whether or not something they were doing was was working. And the violist said, you know, the question is, is it in service to the music? You know, it's not about ego or what do I think? It's what is the music telling us? Because the music will, will reveal the truth. You know, the truth will rise up. And, and so, and I feel that that's so true also in my composing and in my bass playing where when my composing is really flowing, it's not that I'm trying to compose or that it's like a willful thing, but it's that the music is showing me what is supposed to happen. And that's when it's at its most organic is, is when the music shows you how it, how the tune goes, you know, it's not. And, and so when I'm composing, I, I feel like, okay, you know, I had to get the ball rolling with, um, with thematic ideas or, or harmonic ideas or whatever. But once the ball is rolling, that thing's alive and, and um, it shows you where it needs to go. And it shows you when something isn't working, you know, you can feel whether, uh, whether the art is flowing um, or whether it's blocked. And, you know, sometimes you might purposely make art that, that has blocks in it, you know, I mean, I, I, but, um, but in terms of realizing your, your goals, uh, I, I let the music show me, you know, and if I, if I'm being too willful, it's not my best composing. And I will, in those moments, if I'm able to recognize it, I will stop and I will stand up and I'll go take a walk or I'll go for a run or just get away, you know, and clear my mind because I know in those moments, my ego has, has taken over. And, and, um, I don't know. I, it seems like there are a lot of egotistical people in the world who have been successful at one thing or another, but you know, I don't know. So, um, I don't know what to say about the ego, but, but, I kind of like the, the Buddhist angle, which is that, you know, the ego is really not helpful and that it, it confuses us. Um, and so if I can get my ego out of the way as a player, um, as a, as a member of a, of an ensemble, whether it's a jazz combo or an orchestra or whatever, and if I can get my ego out of the way as, as a composer, then the art flows, you know, because the thing is alive and, and, um, yeah. I love that. I, I that, that's such a key point. That ego. I read a book recently by Ryan Holiday called "Ego Is the Enemy," and and Ryan Holiday has been very successful in the startup world and just like is a in business in general. And and it was so interesting because it was, it was all about how that just sabotages so many people. Down, like like to the end. And so I think about that a lot. And. I'd love to know, and, and I love the idea of flow and flow in your composition and that sort of thing. And like, I have all these things in my own life that I do that sort of set me up maybe for, like, you can't maybe make flow happen, but you can sort of set the scene, you know, like, what do you do to set the scene for that? Like for your composition, or your bass playing, do you have any like routines or ritual? You mentioned running, like what, is there anything that you do to like get yourself in that state or make that state likely to happen? Yeah. So my process, um, so sitting at a piano, big grand piano, man, and just hearing the physics, just feeling, feeling it, that's so inspiring to me. And so, and, and in that case, I have a pencil and, and staff paper, and I'm just kind of taking notes and, um, you know, taking lots of notes. And, and I may not use, I may write two whole pages of notes and use none of it. You know, you, you never know, because some of that is, is just process. You know, some of it's you know, is it an, are you at an arrival point or are you just kind of working through ideas in order to get to that arrival point? But it's, but again, it's important to write it down because you never know where that thing is that you're going to really want to keep. And so then once I've got that sort of brainstorming session finished or not finished, but once I've, I've got the ball rolling, then I move over to my computer and I, I move over to my workstation and, I, and I'm, I'm still using logic. I'm using, you know, you can buy these nice samples uh, so that the strings really sound gorgeous and, you know, clarinet really sounds, sounds wonderful. Um, and, you know, and then I, I put it in and I, I find that I have other creative uh, 
that happen when I'm at the computer versus when I'm at the piano. It's like different parts of the brain firing. And, and of course, the interface is different. Instead of having a pencil and paper and my hands on the keyboard, uh, on the piano keyboard, now I've got the, the computer keyboard and, and my trackpad. Uh, what I'm looking at visually, so when I compose in Logic, I actually like to use like the MIDI notation. So I'm not looking at quarter notes and half notes. I'm not looking at sheet music notation yet. I really like the abstract aspect of MIDI notation. Um, which I, I'm trying to describe it to a listener who, who isn't familiar with this. It's like, okay, if I play a note that lasts for one second, um, you know, I could notate that with, with old, you know, sheet music style and I could indicate the tempo so that you know how long that note lasts. Or you can use the software where you can actually draw the note and, you know, how long is it? It's, it's this long. And if I want to make the note a little shorter, I just go up there with my mouse and I click and drag and make, make it shorter. Um, and so, and of course, as you can imagine, the, your, your ability to edit is, is vast. You can slice and dice and duplicate and turn things upside down and back, whatever you want to do. Um, if you've got a melody in the clarinet and you're like, well, wait, I'm not so sure about that. What does it sound like in the bassoon? It's just a snap. You just move it right over to the bassoon. Oh, wait, it's the wrong octave. Okay, bring it down an octave. That takes about half a second. You know, so it, it, as you develop your workflow on the computer, you can really move quite quickly. Um, and that's both as an orchestrator and, and as a composer. So I really love that, that part of the process. And then, okay, so let's say, and I, I usually almost finish the piece in, in, in that sort of mini notation. I might go back to the piano, by the way. So like if phase one is the piano and phase two is the, is the computer, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's linear and that I, you know, I, I still swirl around. So I'll go back to the piano and check stuff out and maybe, whoa, that's a mind boggling uh, voicing that I hadn't thought of. And, you know, the piano with those physical sound waves that are so, I mean, of course I'm hearing physical sound waves from my computer, but it's not, it's not quite the same thing as sitting at, at, at a piano. So, you know, it's going to tickle different parts of my brain, my inspiration. And then I'll go back to the, to the computer and be like, ah, okay, now this is working. So once, but once, let's say, I've gotten pretty far through the computer phase, let's say, or, or that the piece is pretty much written, okay, now I need to notate it. Now I need to bring it into the physical world and have humans play the thing. So that means I need to have notation. So I use uh, Sibelius for that as the, the software. There's, people also use something called Finale. Um, it's just I happened to start for Sibelius a long time ago, and, and I'm very happy with it. So that's what I use. And I just bounce. The term is bouncing, but I, you basically transfer uh, the MIDI information over to the, uh, the notation software, and that's really easy to do. Um, it doesn't always transfer perfectly, so of course you need to proofread stuff. And then you need to add all the sort of dynamics and the shaping. And what's great about that, this phase, the notation phase, is that I still change my mind a lot about the piece. The piece is not done. Um, because now I'm, now I'm using yet another interface in terms of how I'm looking, how I'm interacting with the music. And I'm seeing the notation and I'm, and I'm realizing, oh, wait a minute, I have the winds doing this, but... You know, so, so when I see the notation, it makes me realize things that I might not have noticed through the MIDI notation and things that I wasn't even thinking about when I was sitting at the piano brainstorming. So there's still a lot of change that happens in the notational process for me. Yeah, that's fascinating. No, that's, that's, I love that. It's almost like painting. It's like you start with like this, gen, like you're at the piano and then you get this and then you take it into, and I love working in logic too, like with the MIDI. There's something nice about that versus like actually like in finale or in Sibelius programming. And then you go in and it's like the finishing touches. That's, that's fascinating to me. It's nice. And it, I think one reason it works really well is that when you're in the MIDI um, aspect, you're not thinking about, is this a half note or a quarter note? You know, it's just, oh, this chord is a little too long or, you know, or, oh, I'd like to make this chord a little longer. And so I just draw it. You just draw it on the screen and you listen. And then it's like, oh, yeah, that's that's what I was. That's what I wanted. And it's a more abstract thing. And then you move it over and you say, oh, OK, this is a dotted quarter note or whatever. It's funny. So that by the time I finish with the score, actually notating the score, I kind of look at it in wonder and I think, this is the thing that I wrote <laughs> or, you know, this is the thing that I heard because if you had told me to just sit down with Sibelius and compose this piece, 
I don't. It would. I don't know how that would have gone. I have composed just once directly into Sibelius, um, and that was because the de- there was a deadline of like five days or something. I just had to do it, and and I still like that piece, but but um, that w- that isn't the process that I would prefer, you know. Cause I, I don't like to have to worry about dotted half notes and and is this an eighth note tied to whatever, you know. It's that's a whole other. That's very mechanical. Yeah, it's like a different part of your brain, you know. They and I, I love how it, you kind of separate out those phases. Um, it keeps it, it helps you with clarity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. David, thanks for chatting. Great to have you on the show. And check out everything he's up to at davidaaron.com. And also, follow along with This Week and all the other jazz content we put out here over the years at controversyconversations.com slash jazz. I hope you're enjoying this week. And tomorrow, we're putting out an episode featuring some excerpts from all the jazz artists we've had in the past, like Rufus Reed, Ron Carlo, Carlos Henriquez, Chuck Israels, and many others. I'm so glad to have you along with me for this journey into the world of jazz. And if you'd like to reach out and offer any suggestions for another thematic week, a guest idea, anything like that, I'd love to hear it. Feedback at ContrabasedConversations.com is a great way to get in touch with me. I respond to every email. It might take me a couple of days, but I will get back to you. And I love hearing from people. It just brightens my day when I hear from people who listen to this show. And I hear from people all over the world. I've heard from people in rural Australia. I've heard people from Indonesia, Africa, as well as the United States and California here, and Europe, and Japan, I everywhere in the world, pretty much I've heard from. And I've also got a lot of listeners in various areas of the globe that I haven't heard from, but I know they listen. I know because I see in my podcast stats, we have people listening in Kuwait. We have people listening in Saudi Arabia. We have people listening in South Africa, actually. So whether you're listening in Philadelphia, Chicago, San Francisco, Miami, Djibouti, you name it reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. And we will see you again very soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. 